This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. In Ethiopia, pressure mounts on parties in the Tigray conflict to grant access to humanitarian services. Oxygen shortage hits hospitals in Tunisia as the country fights a wave of coronavirus infections. And Delta variant infections rise in Nigeria amid a strike by doctors. Hello and welcome to Africa Live. As always, great to have you with us. I'm Richard Ntah, live in Nairobi. And for those of you joining us from across the continent and around the globe, we thank you for joining us. And tonight, I'm alongside my colleague Uche, who has our business headlines. Uche. Thank you, Richard. And here's a look at what's coming up on Africa Live. This. Bread prices could rise in Egypt as the president announces a further reduction in subsidies. And the Durban Harbour in South Africa reopens for business. Of course, all that coming up within the program for now. Back to Richard. Thank you so much, Uche. Once again, welcome to Africa Live. Great to have you along with me for this hour. Let's begin in Ethiopia, where the U.S. aid chief, Samantha Powers, is in the country, where she says her priorities are to push Addis Ababa and the Tigray's People's Liberation Front for a ceasefire. Power also wants the two sides to open humanitarian corridors in Tigray. Her visit comes amid concerns that aid is not reaching hundreds of thousands of people affected by the clashes. Earlier, Power visited Sudan's Amra Kuba refugee camp, where thousands of Ethiopians have settled there after fleeing the conflict. Fighting between government forces and the former TPLF ruling party in Tigray began last November. TGTN's Grumchala has more on that from Addis Ababa. Samantha Power, U.S. Uh, aid administrator, after her visit in Sudan, is now in Addis Ababa, is already engaging Ethiopian officials. We have heard that, including Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, other uh, Ethiopian official, uh, officials are expected uh, to brief Samantha Power, and she's also expected to uh, visit uh, places where uh, she thinks uh, are important in order to unlock the humanitarian hiccup that is happening uh, at the moment in the Tigray regional state. As you might understand, uh, she's been in the region, especially in Sudan, starting from Saturday, um, and uh, was visiting refugee camps where Tigray uh, refugees who played the conflict in the north are uh, at, uh, at the moment. Uh, Samantha, by the way, uh, is in Ethiopia. In order to help uh, find a way of getting humanitarian access to the Tigray regional state, as the UN repeatedly complained, uh, humanitarian access uh, road openings and others are still a problem. Hundreds of trucks still stuck in border areas. So uh, she's expected to meet uh, lots of officials. And by the end of uh, her, her meeting, uh, she's going to brief uh, the media as well. In her visit, Samantha Power is also demanding uh, the uh, ceasefire to be implemented by both the government and uh, the TPLA force in the north. And she also wants the withdrawal of the TPLA force from afar and uh, uh, Amhara regional state in the Amhara ports to also be withdrawn uh, from western Tigray as well as the, Tig uh, the Eritrean force to be withdrawn. Tunisian President Kai Saeed is warning of a repeat in the massive influx of migrants to Europe seen a decade ago. The 2011 migrant crisis began after the ouster of former Tunisian President Ben Ali, which impacted border controls. Over 20,000 irregular migrants reached Italian shores. CGTN's Adnan Shawashi reports on the current situation. The head of state said some groups are exploiting the poverty and misery of irregular migrants in order to undermine relations with Italy and Europe. Some people are still trying to undermine the state from within by treating poor people as a commodity and exploiting their misery. 1,500 people have attempted to cross the sea legally in a short period of time. They want to repeat the 2011 scenario of mass irregular migration, but it will not be repeated again. Head of the moderate Islamist and Nahda party and parliament speaker Rashid Ghannoushi told Italian newspaper Corriere della Sera that President Said needs to reconsider his recent moves, moves that include dismissing the country's prime minister and suspending parliament. Ranushi said the destabilization could see over half a million Tunisian migrants trying to reach Italy. 
Those who are conspiring against the state are using migrant smuggling networks. We will put an end to these networks here in Tunisia and in the north. They want to destabilize the country with the flow and the threat of irregular migration. The Interior Ministry said Tunisian Coast Guards thwarted 11 irregular migration attempts in 48 hours. They rescued 188 undocumented migrants over the weekend. Several bodies were recovered by fishing vessels. We were rescued by Tunisian boats. A Libyan vessel with an armed crew hit our makeshift boat in the sea and caused a fuel leak inside. Two young migrants died immediately while others drowned. The Tunisians saved us and treated us humanely. Our objective was to reach Europe. I paid some $5,000 for the journey. We were supposed to be only 45 people, but there were more than 100 migrants on board. The Interior Ministry announced that the National Guard arrested over 100 individuals in abandoned houses on the coast. These people likely intended to illegally cross the Mediterranean to Europe over the next few days. During the last visit of the Italian Interior Minister and the European Commissioner for Home Affairs to Tunisia in May, Tunisian and Italian authorities agreed to establish a hotline between Tunis and Rome to counter irregular migration attempts from the North African state to Europe. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. Tanzania has kicked off its COVID-19 vaccination campaign with members of the public turning up to get vaccinated in hundreds of centers across the nation. The exercise was launched a week ago with President Samia Saluhu Hassan getting the first jab. CGTN's Isaac Lukando has more. More than 500 centers across Tanzania have been prepped for the vaccination program. At this center in Dar es Salaam, politicians' spouses and journalists are getting vaccinated. The wife of the country's prime minister who is hosting this particular vaccination exercise here is urging more people to come forward. So I call upon citizens, wherever they are, to come out and get vaccinated for the sake of their health and for the sake of enabling us and all other Tanzanians to carry out income-generating activities and growing our economy. A week ago, President Samir Slu Hassan got vaccinated in public to encourage a largely sceptical population to get the life-saving jabs. However, the government admits that it faces an uphill task in raising the public's enthusiasm for vaccines. For those who are misinformed, the health ministry, artists and media must work on informing people on the importance of vaccines. But for those who are willing, we will ensure that our country has enough vaccines so that people keep getting vaccinated. Tanzania has so far received one million COVID vaccine doses donated by the United States through the COVAX facility. The government says millions more are in the pipeline, the plan being to eventually get 60% of the population vaccinated. According to the latest Ministry of Health statistics, 1,017 people have so far been hospitalized with COVID-19 with around 21 deaths. The government is hoping that a vaccinated public will help keep this number from rising further. Despite some opposition to COVID-19 vaccines, many Tanzanians are positive about getting the jabs. Uh, um, I, I got COVID last year. My parents got COVID uh, just a few, a couple of weeks ago. So, so I understand how bad this, you know, this virus is. And so for me to, to get vaccinated and to know that I'm safe, uh, it feels very good. People who are spreading misinformation and disinformation, they are ahead of uh, educators, people who are supposed to provide the right information. And with the social media, uh, fear mongering has been all over. So I think this is the biggest issue that we have to tackle. The government says COVID-19 vaccines in the country are voluntary and free of charge, although commercial ones may be available at a future date. It says it is hoping to win the fight against the coronavirus pandemic one jab at a time. Isaac Lukando, CGTN, Dar es Salaam. Earlier, we spoke to Dr. T. Ketsela Mengestu, the WHO country representative to Tanzania, on the vaccination exercise in the country and the challenges in tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's take a listen. For more than four decades, uh, WHO has been working closely with the national immunization program and partners to ensure the country has access to needed vaccines and the supply chain is able to store and distribute the vaccines in line with the agreed schedule. So taking this experience and building on it, 
WHO now is at the center of COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Specifically, uh, we worked with partners to assist the country prepare the COVID-19 vaccine introduction uh, through the use of vaccine introduction readiness assessment tool. We played an advisory role in supporting the country develop a national deployment and vaccination plan for COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, which comprehensively describes all elements of the country's approach to COVID-19 uh, vaccine rollout. Uh, WHO also provided coordination assistance, and it was through coordinated efforts that the COVAX facility was able to deliver the more than 1 million vaccine doses, which was donated by the United States government. And uh, also we have been uh, providing technical guidance and capacity building for frontline health workers to deliver the COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, this is a global pandemic. And so uh, Tanzania is not immune to challenges that other nations uh, face uh, in, in, in COVID. Uh, and being a low income nation, uh, Tanzania's health system faces a threat of a difficult balance between the urgency and agility needed to respond to a pandemic. Uh, there is shortage of healthcare workers, uh, capacity to conduct massive testing in the population uh, is very low. Uh, there's also demand for additional therapeutics and IPC uh, equipments. And uh, WHO provides technical advice on critical response actions for COVID-19 surveillance and case investigation, uh, among others. Egyptians who were set to take the second dose of their AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine have been surprised with a sudden delay. But thanks to Chinese vaccine availability, the nation's COVID-19 vaccination program is still ongoing. Egypt is currently administering the Chinese vaccines made by Sinopharm. It is also expecting some 6 million doses from China's Sinopharm in the coming weeks. Here is Adel El Marfoui with more. Scores of Egyptians were scheduled to take their second dose of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine this week. But hours before their appointments, many of them shared on social media text messages from the health ministry informing them that their appointments have been delayed for at least 10 days. The government didn't officially announce a reason for this sudden delay. Egypt was supposed to receive millions of vaccines, but because of the huge global demand on vaccines, and specifically AstraZeneca, the ministry postponed the second dose schedules due to a shortage in stores. That is temporary, though, because this week we're getting two million doses of the jab, which, after analysis, shall be available in two weeks' time. This schedule interruption has highlighted the significance of Chinese vaccines. If it weren't for the millions of jabs China sent to Egypt, the nation's vaccination campaign could have slowed down even further. We have contracts for millions of doses from Sinovac and Sinopharm, both produced in China. When we start using the local production of Sinovac, we won't import it. Yet, we will still rely on Sinopharm. When the locally produced Sinovac vaccine becomes available, that will save Egypt from such supply turbulence. It will also decrease the reliance on imported vaccines. Egypt has so far administered about 5.5 million COVID-19 vaccines. Almost 1.8 million people are fully vaccinated. That's less than 2% of the population. Health experts say a delay in getting the second dose won't affect the vaccine's efficacy as long as it remains within two weeks of the original vaccination date. Since Egypt began vaccinating citizens, Chinese vaccines have led the nation's campaign. The first vaccines Egypt received were Chinese, and the first COVID-19 jab Egypt manufactured was also Chinese. Officials say by mid-August they will have produced 10 million doses of the Sinovac vaccine jab, boosting inoculation efforts ahead of a possible fourth wave. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. COVID-19 survivors in Uganda are battling social stigma related to the virus. Many are telling tales of how difficult it is to reintegrate into society after recovering from the virus. CGTN's Hilary Ayasega reports. 
Rita Asimire contracted COVID-19 at the end of May. She's not sure where she picked it up from, but self-isolated for two months as she recovered. Now that she's better, she's keen to start seeing her friends again. But not everyone is welcoming her with open arms. I sent out a tweet and said I beat COVID. So very many nice messages came through, but someone sent me a screenshot and said, so all along you were, you know, like you wanted to kill us, something like that. I, I'm not their friend anymore. <laughs> She's not the only one facing COVID-19 related stigma. Stigma is real. You see some of these things, you just hear about them and they fly, but losing both your parents within a spell of like seven days of each other, it's that the whole village gets to know what exactly it was. Some of them don't want to pass near the gate. But the interesting bit was people, the border guys that people, hey, can you come and pick me up? Ah, they were not there. There is little data to show how many people have faced COVID-19 related discrimination in Uganda. But psychologists say fear and anxiety around catching the disease is feeding the problem. As more people beat the virus, health activists are urging local authorities to extend psychosocial programs to the community. They fear that if the services are not extended to COVID-19 survivors, more people could suffer mental health problems. Uganda has so far recorded more than 94,000 cases and 84,000 COVID-19 recoveries. We have lost so many people to COVID, so you don't know when. There's anxiety of either catching it, there's anxiety of, dis of uh, exposure to it, there is anxiety of after you have tested, how do you relay this information that I have tested actually positive? So there's a lot of things going on, like also social stigma. Uganda's health ministry is now sending health workers into communities to create awareness on how to interact with COVID-19 patients. Hopefully, such interventions could help recovered patients like Asimile to socialize easily. Hilara Isga, CGTN, Kampala, Uganda. Nigeria has entered its third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. Health authorities in the country have confirmed the presence of the Delta variant. Although millions of Moderna vaccines have arrived from the U.S., experts fear the situation may worsen amid a renewed doctor strike. Correspondent Deji Badmas has more on the story. Health authorities in Nigeria had always feared a third wave of the pandemic was possible. That fear has now become reality. Uh, the data shows that right now in Lagos, one in ten people that we test turn out to be positive a test positivity ratio of about 10%, same in Akwa Ibom State. The national average is 6%, but it varies really from about 1% in many states to about 8-10% uh, in a few uh, states. Given our uh, relationships, travel, it's very likely that uh, with this virus, if we don't take specific measures, we'll see uh, even further increases. Rising cases of the Delta variant has been seen in seven states, including the nation's capital, Abuja. Health officials put the number of the confirmed Delta variant cases at over 30. With an initial supply of nearly 4 million doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine exhausted, the government is now looking to resume vaccination in the coming days. Nigeria has just received 4 million doses of the Moderna vaccine from the United States. About 1% of our population have received a double dose of the AstraZeneca um, uh, vaccine. This is quite low, um, especially considering that we now have confirmed cases of the third wave and we're exploring all avenues to possibly ramp up access to vaccination so as to reach which, what we see as a global herd immunity of about 60% of the population. The increase in COVID-19 infections is happening at a time when doctors in the country's public hospitals are on strike, triggering concerns it could worsen the situation for the country. The Federal Ministry of Health is engaging resident doctors who have embarked on an industrial action with a view to quickly resolving the issues. And while this is going on, all medical directors at federal and also state hospitals are hereby directed to ensure that service delivery is not disrupted in their hospitals. 
Authorities say the samples of the recently received 4 million doses of the Moderna vaccine are currently being evaluated by the country's uh, drug regulatory agency to certify if they are fit for use in Nigeria before they are distributed to the various states across the country for mass vaccination. Dejbatmos, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. You are watching Africa Live. The news continues. Do not go away. We have a lot more coming your way. Here's what's ahead. South Sudan government and the UN in new plan to reach people in need of protection and aid. And questions linger as Lebanon remembers last year's blast that killed more than 200 people. Africa is a continent of diversity with varied climates and enchanting geography and a people so distinct but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back to Africa Live. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Richard Nta. Stakeholders in South Sudan are working to improve access to people in need of humanitarian assistance and security. This is particularly important in areas where communal violence and a lack of infrastructure has left many people vulnerable. CGT and Daniela Pearson brings us the details. Stakeholders have been meeting in Juba to discuss security matters affecting the country. Involved in the deliberations are government officials, security forces, and the UN mission in South Sudan. Even if we encounter differences of approach and points of difference in the past, working together with respect for each other's responsibilities will make us stronger. This workshop is very central for trust building and for us to be able to open a new page in how to coordinate our activities between various institutions of security of our country and the United Nations mission in South Sudan. Authorities have raised concerns over challenges faced by peacekeepers and humanitarian agencies during missions. Their work involves reaching people that need protection, food and medical supplies among other urgent assistance. Officials say that a common effort to streamline security is needed. It could only be possible because of very close interactions, regular visits all around, by building mutual trust, by sharing the information at every level, leaders and staff, and solving any challenges amicably through discussion and dialogue. We are, uh, as a force, much more mobile than we've ever been. We are, patrols are going out all over the country to protect uh, civilians wherever they may be threatened. And the level of threat has spread throughout the country, uh, and it's necessary for us uh, to have that access. A need for quick action was prompted after thousands of people fled their homes following armed attacks in the western Equatoria region. Daniela Pearson, CGTN. It's been a year since an explosion ripped through Beirut's Lebanon's port, killing hundreds, injuring thousands, and displacing hundreds of thousands. In that time, Lebanon's economy has slipped from a crisis to severe crisis mode. Blast damage and displacement remain largely unaddressed, and families of victims are still demanding answers and accountability for the loss of loved ones. Stephanie Freed reports. After the explosion shockwave hit Mirna, she walked three and a half kilometers to the nearest hospital with shards of glass protruding from her eye and bones jutting from one hand. Over the past year, she has undergone five surgeries. 
She personally paid for four of those procedures plus physical therapy, despite Lebanese government assurances they'd cover all blast victims' medical expenses. I can't afford it anymore. I take loans from people to pay for treatment, then go for surgery, pay back the loan, take another loan, get another surgery, work, pay it. Funding and government initiatives are also in short supply for rebuilding and repairing damage. NGOs, fixing homes and schools, mostly depend on private sector donations. With the passage of time and the ongoing COVID-19 crisis, donor fatigue has set in. It's going to hit the one-year mark since the explosion, so funding has decreased a lot. Yeah, but there's a lot of work to be done, of course, that doesn't stop. Corrupt, inert leaders are sinking Lebanon into what the World Bank describes as possibly one of the top three most severe financial and economic crises seen worldwide since the 1800s. The new normal? Widespread shortages on everything from baby formula to medical supplies to petrol. Half the amount I put in gets burnt up, waiting in line to refill. There's nothing I can do about it. This is Lebanon. I've been in line for 45 minutes. Leaked documents point to numerous Lebanese officials who knew and warned about the dangerous chemicals stored in Beirut's port before the blast. But according to international organizations, Lebanon's government is blocking investigations. The state needs help. It's broken and run by a group of corrupt politicians. You want to talk about the state? To break Lebanon's current paralysis, regional experts are advocating the IMF, donor countries and expats set up funds and initiatives and a new government that represents the people be formed. Stephanie Freed, CGTN. An extreme heat wave is causing wildfires in southern Europe. Firefighters in Greece have tackled more than 60. The government has issued warnings to limit electricity use and travel. Italy and Turkey are also battling blazes. Evangelos Sitspas has more from Athens. Parts of southern Europe remain in a state of emergency for the fifth day as temperatures continue to hover at record levels. Here in Greece on Tuesday, temperatures reached 47 degrees Celsius, putting the country at an extreme risk of wildfires. The Greek government issued a warning last week to its citizens and tourists to avoid unnecessary work and travel and to limit electricity use as the government tries to cope with the crisis. For now, major tourist attractions such as the Parthenon remain closed. We're dealing with the worst heat wave since 1987. As you can imagine, the increased demand of electric power creates a significant burden to the system. I want to reassure Greeks that everything humanly possible has been done to secure the country's power supply. But we're also asking consumers to help us. Firefighters in Greece say they have tackled more than 60 wildfires in the last 24 hours. But the most devastating so far are seen in nearby Turkey, where crews and volunteers battle a string of blazes along its coastline for the sixth day. On the wooded hills of Atalia's Magnavat district, residents fled their homes as planes and helicopters fought the fires from air. More than 130 blazes have raged across parts of Turkey, killing at least eight people and burning more than 118,000 hectares of land. Neighborhoods in the tourist city of Bodrum have also been evacuated. In Italy, holidaymakers were evacuated after wildfires devastated a pine wood near a beach in Pescara. More than 800 wildfires were recorded over the weekend, mainly in southern Italy. Europe's southern Mediterranean coast is famous for its high summer temperatures, which draws the tourists. It's an area that is used to dealing with wildfires, but not at this scale. Authorities say that the number of fires that are recorded this year are the highest on record, blaming climate change for creating the deadly conditions. Evangelo Sipsas for CGTN, Athens, Greece. Back here in Africa, experts in Nigeria are raising the alarm over a rise in the number of reformed ex-prisoners relapsing into crime. They blame it on poor prison services, a bad economy exacerbated by COVID-19 and the stigma 
against ex-prisoners. Correspondent Tessa McKende reports. Adamu Tanko, not his real name, does menial jobs like mixing sand with cement for molding blocks at this factory in Jos, not central Nigeria. He is a former inmate who served a jail term in 2019 for theft. But he says reintegrating into the society has been challenging. Life hasn't been easy though. You know, challenges up and down. You know, I'm an African man. I'm supposed to provide for my family. And things are not just working for me the way like I'm picturing it. So sometimes I do get tempted sometimes to like, what if I make that move, that wrong move again then? But, you know, the economy, hardship, you know, so I do get tempted sometimes, but uh, I really want to be a better person. According to a 2019 report in the European Journal of Scientific Research, 300,000 offenders were reported between 2013 and the first half of 2015 in Nigeria. Of that, 10% were first-time re-offenders, with some relapsed as many as six times. If you conduct another survey now or research, you will find, you know, tremendous increase. We're talking about uh, the evolution in criminality. Today, the kind of uh, crimes committed are, uh, are more sophisticated in, 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 in nature. Uh, the economy could be a reason, you know, uh, population explosion could also be another reason. And then bad governance too. The biggest challenge here within the Nigerian society is stigma. No sense of belonging. He doesn't really, uh, he cannot cope outside. Whatever it is that made him go into the prison is also waiting for him when he comes out of it. The NGO, City of Refuge Friends Club, offers help to prisoners and former prisoners like Adomo. The first thing we do is counseling. And counseling can take a while, you know, because first, this person, you have to befriend him to a certain level, that he will open up and even tell you the truth that he didn't say in court. Once we start to notice that these people we are dealing with, you know, are ready for the next step, then we ask them, do you want to go to school? Some will say yes, some will say no, they want to go into business. We respect people's free will, even if they are ex-convict, we respect their free will. Whatever they want to do, if it is school, we enroll them into our school. You know, if it is business, we give them a soft grant to actually enroll. Activists say overcrowded and dilapidated prison facilities are part of the problem, not offering prisoners the support needed to turn their lives around and prepare them for when they get out. The Nigerian government says it is working towards the rehabilitation of prisoners and the entire prison service. The government in 2019 changed the name of its prison service to the Nigerian Correctional Service after signing the Nigerian Correctional Service Act into law. The move is meant to give the prison service a new image and make it function more as a correctional institution rather than mere shelter for persons serving jail terms. The service and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime this year launched a project aimed at strengthening the social reintegration prospects of prison inmates by enhancing their access to education, vocational training, recreational activities and other support services. The hope is that with such efforts, ex-prisoners like Adamu will not be tempted into crime again. Tessim Akende, CGTN Jaws, Nigeria. The news continues on Africa Live. Time now for our business segment with Uche. Uche. Thanks, Richard. And coming up on Africa Live Biz. Bread prices could rise in Egypt as the president announces a further reduction in subsidies. And the Durban Harbour in South Africa reopens for business. Business in Africa is at the crossroads where opportunity meets innovation where profitable new markets collide with global trends. From the sound of an African bell on a stock market floor to the shout of a trader in a bustling free market. It's colorful, vibrant and exotic. CGTN stands at the gateway to Europe, Africa and the Middle East. From Morocco to South Africa, we talk to the dealmakers and actors who fuel its engines of growth. Only on CGTN. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes.
Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi is planning to hike the price of subsidized bread in the country. He says that the increase will help his government cover the cost of meals provided to school children. Now, this is the latest move in a series of austerity measures taken by the Egyptian government to overhaul the economy. The president did not give details on the amount or timing of the looming hike. The Egyptian leader spoke during the opening of a mega food industries complex in the Nile Delta province of Menufia. Now, the complex is aiming to provide school meals for around 13 million children across the country. The time has come for the price of bread and loaf of five piastres to increase. Someone might tell me that I should have asked the government or Prime Minister, Dr. Mustafa, or the Supply Minister to make the decision. But no, I will take responsibility for changing the situation in front of my country and my people. It is unbelievable that we provide 20 loaves of bread for the same price of just one cigarette. I'm saying this live on television to all Egyptians, this has to stop. We need 8 billion Egyptian pounds to supply meals to our students, and we don't have the money. The issue needs to be reorganized in a suitable way. I'm not saying we make it significantly more expensive, as it costs the government 65 or 60 piastres. But this has to stop. And in South Africa, the Durban Harbour has reopened for business. The main port facility run by state-owned Transnet was under force majeure for a week after its IT system was hacked. Now, all systems have been restored, but the hard work to clear a massive backlog is now underway. The country's recent rioting and looting had already caused a break in the supply chain. Getting critical food lines into stores is being prioritized now. Here's Sumitra Naidu with the details. The Durban Harbour is the largest port terminal in sub-Saharan Africa. It's also the busiest terminal on the continent, with over 31 million tons of cargo moving through it annually. The alleged cyber attack brought all movement to a standstill. Now Transnet is in a rush to move containers with perishable goods. The Transnet system has been restored after the cyber attack. We still have over 400 reefer containers in Durban that we need to move out of the port within the next couple of days. Obviously today that work all starts and the importers are now working with manufacturers, with the port um, services, with the Department of Agriculture's veterinarians to now enact that. Authorities were more concerned as the attack occurred as the civil unrest was slowly dissipating, but government backed away from linking the cyber attack to the insurrection. South Africa's processed meat sector relies heavily on imported ingredients. The SA Meat Association says much of this product is destined for inland producers who employ thousands and feed millions of South Africans. We have two manufacturing operations in Durban which have been severely damaged by the, the, the rioting and the looting. Um, both of those facilities are going to take quite a while to get back into production because they are they are physically damaged, burnt. One is significantly damaged and may take as much as 12 months to get back into production. But what also transpired is that there were four coal storage facilities in Durban that were significantly damaged. In May, prior to the unrest, 16,000 tons of raw meat material was imported to South Africa, 75% of which came to the country via the Durban port. MDM, the biggest raw material that we import, is predominantly used in what we call emulsion products. So Vienna's, Polonia and Russian are the typical examples of those. And they're a very significant protein um, for the less affluent communities of South Africa. And they are really large volumes that get used um, in South Africa, get produced. So we, we import about 16 to 18,000 tons a month of MDM. Given the disruption to the retail supply chains, producers have had to ramp up their orders to replace what was lost in the value chain. Port authorities are also working around the clock to ensure these food supplies are delivered soon. Sumitra Nadu, CGT and Johannesburg, South Africa.
And let's head over to Nigeria now, where the, for the fourth consecutive year, the economy has seen a major reduction in its capital importation inflows. Now, a recent report shows that Nigeria recorded a decline in capital importation by 54% in the second quarter of this year. And that has further piled pressure on Africa's largest economy. Here's Deji Batmus with more. The capital importation report is a clear indication that more than a year since Nigeria exited its last recession, Africa's biggest economy is still struggling for foreign investors' confidence and recovery is still slow. In the first quarter of 2021, the country attracted $1.9 billion. The second quarter figure of $875.6 million is among the worst in recent times, with foreign portfolio investments alone accounting for 63% of the figure. So it's a pretty much uh, complicated situation that we have right now compared to uh, where we were, all right, first half of 2021. Um, our recovery process is still very much weak, all right, compared to the 16, 17 recession. And uh, also um, the fact that um, the year so far has been filled with a lot of fiscal um, indecisions in the sense, all right, um, conversations around the revenue crisis, conversations around um, the insecurity challenges and how it's impacting on inflation and further stretching the value of the currency. And uh, so when we put all, this, this, all these things together into context, it will, um, simply speaks to the fact that there is a great lack of clarity in the Nigerian economy right now, and that's impacting on investors' confidence. The report shows the United Kingdom continues to top the source of capital investments in Nigeria, accounting for 35% of the total capital inflow. While the banking sector accounted for the bulk of the inflow, 89% of the capital investments ended up in Lagos, the country's commercial capital. We've not also done the hard work of ensuring that FDIs and capital investments are properly spread across different sectors to unlock value chain relevance and um, to grow the potential of returns and all that. And that's also, also uh, depending on the fact that uh, we've not appropriately locked the potential of those sectors all right, and linking them up to more market-focused opportunities and exploring uh, market value in that space. Until there's a form of market value, investors will not see the need to invest in a particular sector. And as there's a form of an enabling environment, when it talks about security and all of that, it's also the same thing. Investors will not see any incentives to invest. The struggle to attract foreign capital inflow is telling on the country's reserve, and by extension, the local currency, which has been coming under increasing pressure in the last one year. But what we have noticed is that uh, because of the dwindling uh, foreign uh, reserve uh, that we are experiencing uh, in the country, uh, that CBN has not been able to meet up with uh, uh, the demand of this uh, foreign investor anytime they want to leave the country. So because of the, that, some of them are trapped in the country. They've not been able to repatriate their fund uh, back to their destination. So because of that, they've been uh, skeptical in bringing fresh fund into the system lately. The last time Nigeria had a major break in its capital importation inflow was in 2017. But four years after, the country is yet to see another rise, indicating a significant drop in investors' confidence in the nation's economy. The insecurity challenge in some parts of the country has also not helped matters at all. Deji Badmos, CGTN, Lagos. Nigeria. And let's turn our attention to Asia now. Authorities in Thailand are taking drastic measures to stop the spread of COVID-19. They have sealed off 575 worker camps in Bangkok. Most are home to laborers from Myanmar, Cambodia and Laos. And now these measures have put millions of migrants out of work, forcing many to flee to their home countries. Here's Dusita Sako reporting from Bangkok. Every day they wake up weaker, more helpless, more desperate. Tone has not eaten for two days. He lives with more than 40 other migrants from Myanmar and Cambodia at this sealed-off construction site in the heart of Bangkok. Before the pandemic, they lived, ate and slept in unfinished buildings and sent most of their savings home to support their families. Their hands built homes for the city's affluent. Those hands are now tied, out of work, out of options. We are suffering. We have no money. We cannot send money home to our families while also suffering. We want to go home. Even if we have nothing, 
at least we can be with the family. There's an estimated four to five million migrant workers in Thailand, the majority from Myanmar, Cambodia and Laos. Most are living at the mercy of their employers. Since June, Thai police mobilized to seal off construction sites to ensure workers do not leave, a drastic measure in an attempt to contain the virus that is ravaging the country. The life of Cambodian migrants is like escaping a tiger into the mouth of a crocodile. They are overwhelmed with difficulties. Around 80 percent of them are desperate to return home. Factories closed, construction camps sealed off. The lives of millions of migrant workers living in the shadow of this pandemic have been cut off from aid and assistance. In desperation, thousands have fled to escape this virus, to escape this hardship. But for many, they return home to where their economic challenges continue. Cross-border migration is now complicated. The once well-trodden routes of the past have been redrawn. Checkpoints, the risk of arrest, brokers charging huge fees to cross the border using small roads through dense jungles. Two months ago, Duong made this journey. She crossed safely, only to find herself in a tiny classroom of a rural school transformed into a quarantine camp. COVID-19 spread among migrants there. She was confined with seven other people, all sharing one bathroom. Now back in Cambodia with her son, she knows this may be just the beginning of her problems. It was a difficult decision to return. I know there are no jobs here. I don't have land for farming, so all I can do is stay home. There was no work in Thailand. For more than one month, I had no work. For Thailand's migrant workers, the deadly third wave is a top-up crisis, compounding to their world already full of anxieties and uncertainties. And even with borders now closed, hunger is stronger than any border policy, stronger than the fear of COVID-19. Lucita Sao Gao, CGTN, Thailand. Well, that's all for now on Africa Live Biz. But coming up on Global Business Africa, Africa recorded a rise in venture capital deals in 2020 compared to 2019. And that's despite the ravages of the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, all that coming up at top of the hour. For now, back to you, Richard. Thank you so much, Uche. Uh, moving along, a Chinese painter, Captain Zhai Mo, and two of his crew members have entered the 75th parallel north, close to halfway on their northeastern passage to the Arctic. The four-month non-stop voyage in the Arctic Ocean began at the end of June. If successful, Captain Zhai and his team will become the first humans to complete the route. And if he does, it won't be the first time the painter has shocked the world. <音>我们国家第一条第一个驾驶帆船就出去的哈挺佩服他的吧我是去外面看我是宅墨我即将还航北冰洋北冰洋毕竟是它是一个最小的一个洋嘛但是从风险是比如在我以往的航海里边是最
，警察搜快艇，十二个大兵，就把我押到那地方，然后把我关在那个房子去，然后关到房子以后，我才看到了一张床，一个一张一个一本圣经，一个小便池，我就想起美国大片里边那。那监狱了，说第一句话，说我是非法闯入他国领土，需要蹲监狱或者罚款。我说蹲监狱吧，你蹲监狱我可以休息嘛。后来他在不断的跟我说说什么，你说我是中国第一个环环环球的，就后来说你就帮我的船帮着修好，第二天就让我离开了。实际上我感觉我比郑和走的远了一点，就是绕过好望角，因为当时可以可以可以说可能是。中国人首次一个人驾那个船绕过航海角，实际上绕过航海角，所以这对一个航海、航海的人来说，它是一个标志。And the latest in sports is on the other side of the break. Don't go away. Here's what's ahead. In sports, neighbors Kenya and Uganda claim first gold medals. At the Tokyo Olympics. <laughs>